Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today for PPMD's uh, gene therapy webinar, um, Turning Obstacles into Possibilities. Um, I'm Eric Camino. I'm PPMD's Vice President of Research and Clinical Innovation. Um, I am joined today uh, by Pat Furlong, uh, PPMD's uh, founder and president, and our two uh, speakers, our guest speakers for today, Dr. Uh, Kanab Kanaboyina Nagaraju, the founding chair of pharmaceutical sciences at Binghamton University, and Dr. Perry Shea, uh, with the Department of Neurology at uh, UCLA Medical Center. Um, so for today's talk, we are going to have, um, I'm gonna give a little bit overview of PPMD's gene therapy initiative um, since it launched in 2017. Uh, we're gonna hear from Dr. Nagaraju on some of the, the work um, that he is doing, looking at uh, the immune response to AAV, uh, mediated gene therapy, and then uh, a discussion on some of the current challenges um, and uh, an open Q&A with uh, the community. So if you have any questions during uh, the talks, there is a chat box at the bottom, so you can please submit your questions there. And when we get to the, the Q&A, we'll um, try to address all of those. Um, so PPMD launched our gene therapy initiative in 2017. Um, and the purpose of this gene therapy initiative was to help educate the community as well as to help accelerate gene therapy and um, get uh, gene therapy delivered uh, two patients with Duchenne. Now, since the launch of this initiative in 2017, we have awarded over $5 million in research grants for gene therapy. And this all kicked off um, with that first uh, $2 million grant to Dr. Jerry Mandel and Dr. Luis Rudino Klaypek uh, for the first systemic delivery of a microdystrophin um, using AAV uh, in Duchenne patients. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with that study um, of those first four boys uh, that were um, dosed with gene therapy. And that has now, uh, of course, become the, the Sarepta uh, product that is in clinical trials. Um, but PPMD has continued to fund a number of other uh, projects under the umbrella of, of gene therapy. Um, we have awarded uh, a little over a million dollars for to research looking at um, either improved or alternative gene therapy products. So um, whether that's newer uh, microdystrophin transgenes that might be able to provide better function for things like the heart or different types of transgenes that can be delivered. When we um, talk about gene therapy um, for the past couple years, we've always been talking about the delivery of uh, microdystrophin transgenes. But of course, with gene therapy, um, we can deliver other transgenes that uh, aren't microdystrophin. And so we've supported some research that have looked at um, other transgenes that could be delivered that may be beneficial to patients at different stages um, of the disease. Um, we've also supported a number of efforts to have a better understanding for gene editing. Um, we do see gene editing as a, uh, you know, a potential therapeutic option. Um, and in order to have this be you know, safe and effective for patients, we need to really understand um, what is going on with, with gene editing strategies. And so um, over the past few years, we've awarded over $900,000 to researchers that are trying to understand and refine different gene editing strategies. So looking at a better understanding for off-target effects um, or you know, the immune response to the, the, the Cas9 protein, um, looking at ways to optimize the, the different gene editing technologies. So that way we can have better um, efficacy and better um, editing efficiency. Um, as well as novel tools that are developed for, for gene editing. Um, as we've often talked about, uh, you know, we describe gene editing as, as having the, the scissors that cut DNA, but uh, researchers have been developing other methods for uh, gene editing. And so we've, we've helped support some research exploring um, newer tools that maybe don't uh, you know, involve cutting of DNA in the same way that we traditionally think about uh, CRISPR. Um, and of course, one of the big areas is in addressing the different barriers. So that way we can have you know, a, an equitable landscape for all individuals who want to receive uh, gene therapy. Um, and that's you know, involved looking at any potential immune response to newly produced dystrophin, um, as well as trying to understand the, the dynamic uh, and relationship between uh, the microdystrophins um, and their you know, role in the heart, as well as the role that fibrosis plays in the delivery of gene therapy. Um, as we think about how we can deliver gene therapy to older patients, um, as well as looking at the ways that the immune system uh, responds to AAV and, and strategies for uh, mitigating um, that, those immune responses. Um, and we've also supported uh, work um, 
with uh, the Pediatric Gene Therapy and Medical Ethics wor Working Group, um, which is a, brings together a number of experts in the field of gene therapy to look at advancing research and policy and education around the, the ethical issues with gene therapy. Um, and there is a, a great lecture series that happened um, a few months ago. And you can, you know, if you search for PGTME um, on the, the PPMD website, you can uh, have access all of these, these uh, lectures. Um, but they touch really important issues um, in gene therapy. And we are you know, really happy to be supporting this type of work because these are addressing questions that we um, you know, deal with constantly when we're talking about gene therapy. So how do you make sure that uh, you know, all patients can receive uh, gene therapy? How do you tackle the different um, immunogenicity and toxicity um, challenges that we face? Um, so these are areas that we think are really important and, and PPMD is committed to continue um, funding um, research within the, the gene therapy space to um, advance our understanding and make sure that uh, we have you know, safe and efficacious treatments for, for all patients um, uh, who want them. And so uh, I'm going to uh, hand over the, the talk now to uh, Dr. Nagaraju, who um, we, along with uh, Duchenne UK, uh, this summer had put out a co-grant call um, looking for research to help mitigate the uh, immune response to AAV gene therapy. Um, and uh, Dr. Nagaraju submitted an excellent proposal that was uh, really highly rated and, and we uh, decided to fund that work. And so um, we're proud to be able to share some of that with you today. Um, and of course, uh, you know, if, if there's any questions that arise, we'll be happy to um, address them following this uh, presentation. So I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, Raju, you should be able to uh, pull up your screen. First of all, I really want to thank uh... Pat Furlong and uh, Eric Camino for giving me the opportunity to talk about some of the work that I am doing with respect to immune response in gene therapy and uh, 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 exon skipping. So what I will do is the next 20, 25 minutes or so, I have uh, divided my presentation into four different parts. A little bit of a background on gene therapy in DMD, because I know some of you know very well, others probably don't know a lot. And then talk about the target tissue microenvironment. In this case, it is the dystrophin deficient muscle. How does it look? So because that is where the correction occurs, it is critical for us to understand the muscle, how it looks, in a dystrophin deficient situation. And then look at uh, when you correct uh, a gene, that in this case, dystrophin, uh, is there evidence for an immune response? So the two types of immune responses I will briefly go over. And then at the end, uh, talking about uh, blocking the immune response with already approved drugs that are mostly targeting the adoptive immune system. And in the new project uh, uh, that, as Eric mentioned, funded in collaboration with Edition UK, is the potential for blocking innate immune response. So first of all, as many of you know, so I have disclosure. So I co-founded two companies. One of them is Riverigen Biopharma that develops Vemerolone an alternative steroid. And I also co-founded Agatha Biosciences that does preclinical trials in neuromuscular diseases. But uh, you know, I'm not directly involved with the gene therapy. It's my academic lab that does uh, here. So uh, <clears throat> dystrophin, as you can see this nice cartoon. So what it does, this green thing is the dystrophin. So it does one thing, it connects the actin within the cell to what we call extracellular matrix that is outside the cell through this complex group of proteins, we call them dystroglycan proteins. So now it also binds to a few other proteins and uh, it's important to remember in the context of gene therapy, you know, they are called dystrobravin, syntropin and NNOS. So if you have dystrophin and that provides stability to this membrane, 
on an electron microscopy picture, this is how it looks muscle membrane. You can see the membrane at the top where my, uh, let me point this with a laser. As you can see this line, it's very nice, contiguous. Let's say in the scenario of missing dystrophy, if you have out of frame mutations, this green thing disappears, that is the dystrophin. When it disappears, this membrane is prone to what we call contraction induced injury. When that injury takes place on the same electron micrograph, as you can see, this is the membrane and you have the membrane breaches. That means stuff from outside can get in and kill the muscle cell and we know stuff from inside the muscle gets out. That is one of the things that we measure is serum creatine kinase. So this is what happens when you don't have dystrophy. The muscle is subjected to injury and membrane breaches. So this beautiful membrane gets damaged. So now the easiest is by gene therapy or exon skipping, whatever is the strategy, you replace this. Maybe you can bring this stage back to this normal stage. So we'll talk a little bit about that. There are problems with that. So if you look at, as I showed in the previous picture, the best situation would be put back the entire gene. So this is the full length dystrophin. You don't have to remember that it, uh, a lot about these numbers. So the problem we have here is, this is a very big gene. It's almost practically impossible to put back a full length gene. So that means, at least as of now, this is a problem. Maybe with the advanced technology, one day we may be able to put back this. So in the absence of the best, what scientists have done for the last several decades, created variants of this full length protein. We call them as mini dystrophins and micro dystrophins. Different, different companies use uh, different versions of it. So as you can see, most of the micro dystrophins, this central portion is missing. And of course, there are some variations between which laboratory it is or which company it is. You have few things present, few things absent, depending on these, these nuances are important, partly, partly because as I mentioned, inside also dystrophin binds to other proteins. So having some of these uh, 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 protein coding regions here will allow binding of NOS in this case for this particular construct. So the next best thing is what we are trying, that is replacing this with all these variants. But one thing important is none of them are full length dystrophins. It's very important to understand. That means we are not bringing to normal C by gene therapy because we are unable to put the full length protein back. So now, how do you deliver this? So delivery is a big problem because skeletal muscle is around 40% of our body. How do you make this to go into every cell of this 40% of the body? So one of the ways people figured out is through what are called as adeno-associated viruses. So these viruses by themselves, they are not infectious. So what people have done, they took the viral genome and then put the gene of interest. In our case, it is this mini or micro dystrophins in the promoters. So promoters is the ones that tell the gene where to express it. In our case, we want the gene to be expressed in skeletal muscle, heart, diaphragm, in those tissues. So as I said, this is a viral 
particle and we are packaging this with the gene, in our case, the uh, mini or micro dystrophin. Now, question is how many viral particles you need to inject? It depends on how big is the organ. If you have an eye disease, you want to fix a genetic uh, uh, a problem for an eye, you don't need a lot. You need 10 to the power of 11 particles. But if it is brain bigger, you need 10 to the power of 12. This is like 10 to the power of 12 means for those of you, trillion viral particles, one trillion, you need to fix a gene in the brain. But our problem is very big. We need one quadrillion, that is 1000 billion viral particles are needed because this constitutes very large skeletal muscle is a very large organ. So that poses problems. How to create this many particles and how to inject this many particles into the body. The body is not going to be, you know, keeping quiet because the body has never seen this many viral particles going at any point in time inside. So those are the things, but experiments are, are already and the animal models, everything uh, is done. Now we have, you all know, as Eric also mentioned, there are lots of companies now involved in gene therapy. Some are in early stages, some are in very advanced stages of gene therapy, and others are trying to come into the picture. So I just named a few of them here. Okay, I want the next phase to understand. So we are delivering this gene to DMD kids. So that means where, where, is the, where are these viral particles going? They are going to muscle. This is how a normal muscle looks. It's very beautiful. And you have capillaries in between and you have my muscle nuclei. This is not how a dystrophin deficient child's muscle looks. This is the normal muscle. How does a DMD kid's muscle look? It looks like this. As you can see, it's not normal. The first thing that you observe is muscle fibers are getting rounded up. That we call dystrophic fibers. And you can see all these blue things. What are those? They are our immune cells. They entered there in order to remove dead and dying fibers, as I mentioned at the beginning, contraction induced injury in the absence of dystrophin makes the fibers die and immune cells come and remove them. So now we are asking this virus to go into this environment, I call this as a micro environment, and correct the gene in these fibers. And there are places where there are no fibers. There are places there are tiny fibers. So it is in a kind of a messy situation. It is not like a normal situation, which I explained in the previous slide. So we want the gene to therapy to work under this scenario. So keep that in mind. This is not normal. So now, I want to explain, it's going to be a complex slide. I don't want you to remember anything that I wrote on the slide, except the steps of this process. So you may all wonder how, what happens before these stages? What is the starting point for this? So this cartoon explains this. So as I said, as you can see, I just drew this as a muscle fibers, very long, and you have breaks. That's what I told previously. If you have those breaks, stuff gets leaked out. What these, in immunological terms, we call this as danger-associated molecular patterns. When a cell undergoes injury, in this case, just, uh, uh, sorry, this is dystrophin-deficient muscle. So it is telling the body and the immune system, hey, there is some damage going on. Can you come and clear up? 
So my lab spent several years studying these early pathways that are activated. So there are receptors that take these signals and activate our innate immune system. So that's what this is. And the innate immune system, when it exists for some time, it naturally transition to what we call adaptive immune system. So as I said, don't remember, no need to remember any of this. Remember, it is starting here with these breaches. Now you saw in the previous slide what I depicting in this cartoon. This is what you're seeing there. So now we use, for example, drugs like prednisone. Prednisone works partly because, see, prednisone affects a lot of things. It affects macrophages, cytokines, adaptive immune cells, antigen-presenting cells, it also affects. So it has really good kind of a temporary benefit, but it has its own problems of long-term side effects. Anyway, so we are going back to, we want to fix this by either exon skipping or gene therapy. Let's talk about this. So this is the previous slide I showed, muscle fiber, this breaks. So our, we imagine because we are doing gene therapy, we are fixing the, you want the muscle. This, so this is the dystrophin straining of a skeletal muscle. See how beautiful it is. This is how a normal muscle looks. So when you put the gene back, either by exon skipping or gene therapy, you want this, but what we are going to create is this. You're not creating this, you are creating this. That means you have some areas where the dystrophin is restored beautifully, but you have areas not restored at all. These green things are those blue cells I showed there, previous slide. You can see the dystrophin is red staining around the fiber. See these green things almost attached to the fibers. That means they are sensing this as a foreign entity because body never expressed this before this, in this case, exon skipping. So what happens when these cells see them, they process and present antigens and generate an immune response to our own fibers. Is this true? Theoretically, we don't know. So that's what we tested. What we did, we did exon skipping, which is slightly uh, uh, better partly because there is no virus involved there. So we wanted to see if you correct dystrophin by exon skipping, what happens? So again, these are all done in mice. This is what happens. Normally before treatment, this is, the, this is how dystrophin looks. This is how normal dystrophin looks. And after correction, you can see some areas nicely corrected, other areas, there is no correction whatsoever. So under this scenario, because this protein body can see this as foreign because it never existed before. So we wanted to look at responses to dystrophin. This is what we found. We found if you treat mice, not all of them, some develop antibodies to dystrophin. Untreated mice have no dystrophin. This is the band we are looking. So the message is, even without virus, if you correct dystrophin, you can develop immune response to the gene because body has never seen them before. So we did several experiments to show that. But dystrophin, as you saw, it is inside the cell. Antibodies bind outside. So the main thing is, are there, so our immune system has two components. The humoral response is what we call antibodies. The cell-mediated response is something, if a virus stays inside the cell, we have killer cells that go and attack. So we wanted to see if you correct the gene, whether are there any killer cells that recognize dystrophin. So again, don't remember anything. 
look at this fiber. This is the dystrophin green color. It has a recognition molecule for MSC1. And you have this blue nuclei around this cell. So this is the cell. So those are what we call killer cells, these red cells. They express proteins that kill the muscle fibers called porphyrin. So what we are demonstrating here is, if you express new dystrophin, you elicit a cell-mediated response that may potentially cause damage to the newly formed, better performing muscle. But whether this is going to be so devastating, I, we still don't know. Now, the first part after I presented this data to PPMD several years back, and I told, I wanted to actually test various drugs that are already approved for other conditions that block all those steps that I mentioned. And you know, uh, PPMD has kindly funded this project to me. I will show you brief data on this. What we did in this case, we treated mice with the gene therapy and then we used agents such as prednisolone and rituximab is a anti B cell antibody. That means if you use rituximab, you can eliminate antibody producing cells. And if you use this another antibody, then you can eliminate the T cell interactions. So we also used a, an, a, an analog called VBB6 and a epclinarone because with the exception of these, these are all FDA approved and did the study to see whether gene therapy elicits immune response. So again, look at only this. If you do the gene therapy, 57 or 58% of the mice develop these antibodies, these peaks. If you treat with rituximab, that is, you can block antibody production. None of the mice show antibodies. Same thing happens with this alternate VBP6, but we are unable to block fully with other drugs. So that is telling something for us. That means if using these approved drugs, you can certain situations block antibodies, we may still not be able to block cell-mediated response because we measured cell-mediated response. And again, if you put gene therapy, this blue peak should not be there if there is no cell-mediated response. But that is, this is there means your body is producing immune response to newly formed protein. So, after that experiment, as Eric mentioned, I approached um, uh, PPMD and Dushan UK to basically come up with a strategy because adaptive immune response comes very late in the process. But a lot of the issues that are taking place now, many of the clinical trial problems are sometimes they're very acute. Sometimes they show up within few days or almost immediately after infusion of the virus. What are those? There are innate, what we call innate immune responses. So here is a very nice uh, uh, review. So what, <clears throat> if you take, almost all of us are exposed to these AAVs, what we call uh, majority of us have what are called as pre-existing antibodies. If you have pre-existing antibodies, then if you inject the virus, they basically mop up. That means none of this virus will go to skeletal muscle and do what we are asking to fix the dystrophin gene. So there are ways people can are planning to you know, mute antibodies, decrease T cell responses. And then the two other things, I talked about cell-mediated responses and antibodies in the previous slides. There is very little known what happens when you 
infuse this quadrillion, quadrillion cells into our body. Is body is going to be silent? No. It, the minute after these viruses enter into the body, our innate immune system recognizes them within minutes. So it activates processes that are naturally meant to protect us from outside invaders. So here we are intentionally inducing this. So some of those are called complement proteins. So I'll talk about this. So when anything enters into our body, we have something called as phagocytes. So uh, their function is to go and engulf and take away that viral particle from our body. So when you inject, before even macrophages come into the picture, this virus interacts with lots of proteins. Again, don't, rem don't have to remember this, but remember within minutes after entering the virus, before even macrophages see them, they bind to a lot of proteins that control our innate immune system, especially our clotting mechanisms. The blood clotting machinery acts in concern with the innate immune system that is complement. And again, you don't have to remember this, except that the clotting problems that we notice sometimes in the complement activation problem, they all interact. So what I propose in the grant, since this process takes place very early, within hours, if I block this, can I collapse the rest of the activation process? So I'll show you in the next slides. As I said, anything enters into your body, our macrophages, they eat them. They basically makes them into fra fragments and they digest it and they throw it away. This is what happens to AAV virus also. There are billions of macrophages there. So is this the reason why a lot of virus is not able to go to muscle? Because these are fast, they are picking up. A billion cells picking up over thousand viral particles, you know, they can disappear very fast, they can damage. But if you block this process, can you make the virus to go back to the muscle where it is, where we want it to go? So now in this picture, I have the AAV virus with microdystrophin. Within two hours after entering into the body, macrophages engulf all the virus. And then you have this cascade of events taking place step by step, each step of the process. I will explain them in the next slide. So I call this, I put a lot of viruses here and they bind to this macrophage and then go through step one, step two, step, step three, four, five, and six. So, I tried to block in the previous study, step five and six. But now if I block here, I can collapse this entire other steps. And maybe that thing will redirect the virus that is being neutralized, this time more virus to the muscle. So the entire project is to block these pathways after gene therapy, or at least alert before gene therapy, block this so that you don't have immune response problems. You don't have acute problems of uh, blood clotting problems. You don't have cytokine problems. So that is the proposal that we uh, have done. So the experiments are just starting because of the COVID delayed few things. So I really, really want to thank PPMD for funding this project from a very early stage and continue to be interested in this angle of 
uh, immune response in the especially thank Pat for all the support for so many years and my collaborators at Binghamton University at Children's Hospital in my own lab. So I will stop it here. Thank you. Great. Uh, well, you know, thank you for that presentation. Um, the, going through um, the immune system and the, the response to uh, gene therapy, it's, it's quite a complex subject. Um, and I think you did a, a very nice job of kind of breaking down the, the key components there. Um, and hopefully um, everyone on uh, watching um, found that uh, to be very informative. Um, and so I think too, just to come back to this to help synthesize for, for everyone, um, what we're hoping with, you know, by blocking this early innate immune response um, to the, the AAB um, that hopefully will be increasing the safety as well as uh, enhancing the, the delivery of, of gene therapy. Correct. Yes, absolutely. That is the, because we know currently the gene therapy, the, we, we, there is not a lot of expression, even though we are injecting quadrillion particles. So is it because a lot of the viral particles disappearing due to phagocytosis? If we block that, we will have both advantages of increasing the efficacy, reducing the side effects. And would this also um, potentially help uh, looking towards redosing in the future? That is obviously a, you know, a conversation we've had many times since we've been thinking about gene therapy is uh, the durability um, and how do we approach things like redosing if um, additional um, uh, doses are required? Exactly. So the, the, the redosing is a problem because of immune response to the virus and immune response to the trend gene. We may not be able to eliminate immune response to transgene, but we can manage it. Mm -hmm. So whereas uh, we can, if we eliminate immune response or reduce immune response to the vector, we will be able to redose effectively. That's great. Um, yeah, we look forward to uh, seeing the, the results of, of the study as it continues on. Um, I think now, uh, kind of bring in uh, Dr. Shea as well, just to get some thoughts. There's some you know, topic areas that we um, know are kind of common in this discussion of, of gene therapy. Um, and we wanted to take a, a moment to address some of these questions before we kind of open it up for the, the general um, Q and A. Um, during the presentation, as, as Raju alluded to, you know, prior to the innate immune response and the adaptive immune response, there is um, the possibility that individuals have neutralizing antibodies, um, which could prevent them from even, you know, receiving gene therapy. Um, we also know that, you know, there, there are options, uh, there's private testing, but um, for individuals who want to join a, a gene therapy trial, they have to go through the screening process for any, um, any trial and, and that, you know, knowing your results won't necessarily guarantee you a spot. Um, can you just reflect on, you know, your role as a, as a clinician when you're talking to families, uh, how you um, kind of approach that conversation about neutralizing antibodies, kind of what you're thinking in terms of, um, you know, testing before going through screening processes for um, various clinical trials? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, I like to put it in a little more, uh, in, in, in some, some context, just so that, mm -hmm. you know, we understand what neutralizing antibodies are. You know, if I were to use an analogy, you can think of gene therapy as a, as a little bit of a, an invasion, you know, or <clears throat> you know, a breach of security. And it really is, except, you know, we've re-engineered the virus in this case, which is the invader to, um, to, to be something that's a good thing. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what, what's happened is if, if a, somebody has been exposed to that particular viral uh, species, that particular viral type of particle that AAV in this case, um, then the body's already kind of learned from it and said, you know, we're going to make sure that doesn't happen again. Um, and so that's, the, those are like kind of security guards. And so now if somebody has been exposed to AAV, you know, nine, for instance, um, in the past, just because, you know, AAV nine is out there, um, they're going to have these security guards that are these neutralizing antibodies that are going around sort of um, preventing an AV9 infection from happening again. Um, so, so and, and that, you know, could prevent a successful 
transduction that could prevent a successful effect of the gene therapy because we want the gene therapy, we want the, the viral capsids to make it past any immunological uh, defense, um, any, any neutralizing antibodies. Hopefully the patient doesn't have any, any neutralizing antibodies so that so the viral particles can find its way to the muscle, which is our target tissue in this case. Um, I thought that uh, Raju's presentation was quite elegant because he talked about how we can you know, make sure that the viral uh, capsids make it to the muscle and maybe not get eaten up by the immune system. So I thought that was, that's quite, quite a clever, um, hopefully successful approach to doing that. How do I talk about it? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, we haven't, uh, we've had mostly positive conversations, meaning patients that, um, have not had antibodies against the AAV for most of the clinical trials that we are in. Um, but, you know, I, I think that there have been a couple of disappointments and, you know, in terms of the antibodies being present. Um, and that's, that, that's always sort of a downer. Um, but I, I also like to think of this as a potentially solvable problem in the future. So I don't, want to think of, oh, you know, your child has antibodies, that means gene therapy will never be an option for your child. I think that that's something that we're going to work on. We in our field are going to work on trying to make sure we we are able to dose um, patients, patients in general, um, Duchenne patients, as well as all of our other patients. You know, I think that the whole field is interested in being able to dose eventually adults with any type of genetic disease. And and though everybody is invested in trying to see, is there some way that we can overcome neutralizing antibodies, you know, some way to knock out the guards that are, you know, up that uh, are preventing the infection. And so, you know, um, one of the simplest things to think about is plasma phoresis or plasma exchange, which is to, you know, take out um, any antibodies that are in the blood, physically take them out. Um, That's what plasma exchange is. Um, that, probably works to some extent. I think we're also interested in, in perhaps uh, exploring certain medications, which may, you know, um, may suppress the immune system um, to try to, to get that under control. So that's sort of the positive light that I tried to put on, on the neutralizing antibody uh, story. But it's, it's at this point, it's not a problem we've solved. So we, you know, we're only able to, to dose, um, patients that don't have neutralizing antibodies or don't have antibodies, depending on how the clinical trial is, is designed. In, in, in regard to that, um, you know, those, those strategies you're discussing, those are the much more, you know, near term, those are present day. We, we have uh, drugs that can suppress the immune system. Plasmapheresis is, is used in the hospitals. This isn't kind of the, the far off goal of um, different, you know, lipid nanoparticles and things like that. We're like, this is taking tools we have. Um, what are the, the barriers for starting to apply those to um, gene therapy? Is it we're, we're still too early within the, the stages of clinical trials? Is this something that you think will follow um, approvals? Um, just kind of your insights on, on what you think is, is maybe the, or, or what we need to do in order to support getting to those and, and starting to, to evaluate whether that is a, a solution for Duchenne. Well, it's not being done systematically at this point, but I, you know, certainly there are starting to be animal reports on on these types of studies being done in animals, which will help us understand. You know, every time we're doing this for the first time, it's an experiment, and none of us really like to think that we're experimenting on children. You know, um, um, and you know, certainly after we've at least got some positive, promising data from from animal studies, I think it'd be it's appropriate to do similar types of uh, studies. Um, in, in a controlled clinical setting on, on patients. And so that's, I, I think we'll be there soon. You know, everyone's already asking these questions. I mean, this is a very relevant issue. Um, and so we, I, I think that uh, it's only a matter of time, I think, before we start to do this and we're, we're gonna need to be able to see um, if we can overcome these antibodies. Great, thank you. Um, and actually, we, we have been getting a lot of questions rolling in, so I might actually start addressing some of these as well, because I, I think there's some, some really good ones. Um, so, uh, Raju, would you be able to um, explain, so within uh, the research that you're doing now, uh, the, the kind of uh, compounds that you're looking at for uh, you know, targeting the immune system, and are these um, 
new or, uh, or you know, approved or um, the compounds that are being uh, still explored in other um, diseases? Yes. So the first part, uh, I think, uh, uh, of the study where I looked at the immune response, especially the humoral and cell mediated immune response, on, with the exception of one, all of them are approved drugs. So I also want to mention that uh, you know, Im blocking immune response has been extensively studied in autoimmune rheumatic diseases. There are really quite effective uh, biologics that are coming up. And one of those that I used here is an anti-B cell antibody called rituximab. So when I used rit rit rituximab is, you know, very frequently used, of course, it is initially approved for a hematological malignancy, but now for arthritis and others. Uh, so that uh, using rituximab, we were able to block clearly the antibody response to dystrophy, but that is not enough to block the cell mediated response, which is probably more damaging. So the drug that I used, CTLA4 IG, that did not work. So it's a trial and error. I have to go back and probably try another T cell uh, modulator to look at because this one did not work. So, and I also used eplinerone, that is another approved drug for heart. So I did not see uh, immune response effect there. And of course, prednisone worked very well. It blocked the antibody response that is expected in this case. And as you all know, many uh, uh, children before gene therapy, they are, they take also uh, prednisone. Yes, no, I think that's that's comforting to know as we do have that ramp up of, um, in, in all the trials, the high, higher dose of, of prednisone for an extended period of time before they, they taper back down. Um, and also something that, you know, we, we liked about the research was that it was looking at some of these approved drugs. So it makes um, translating that in, in, in over and repurposing it for Duchenne, you know, something that is um, more near term. So Raju, a quick question. Having worked in or whole organ transplant in, in uh, long ago, um, we, we had really protocols for immune suppression and they used combination of drugs. Why can't we utilize those same immune suppression protocols that are used in whole organ transplant and apply them here? Is that the way to start? That's a great question, and I think we should because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. As you know, the transplantation uh, field is far, far advanced. I think it is time for us to consider, uh, and I think maybe Pe uh, Perry can comment on it, at least experimental stage, consider this and gain from the, what the field has learned. waiting for me to comment. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think, yeah, we're just going to have to develop these protocols to figure out what's the right way to do this. Um, but it's, it's a matter of trial and error to some extent. And so hopefully more trial, successful trials than error, you know. Um, and then we've actually had a number of questions that have come in that are kind of relating to um, the different stereotypes of AAV and, and in cross reactivity of, of neutralizing antibodies, as well as questions about, um, you know, redosing and using, um, you know, one stereotype. So again, for anyone, if, if you're not familiar with the language, the stereotype being the different types of the virus. So an AAV8 versus an AAV9 or the RH74. So um, could you Talk about what we know about a potential cross reactivity and, and whether using different stereotypes is, uh, you know, is that a, a strategy for, for getting around neutralizing antibodies or is that something that won't um, really help in, in this, uh, you know, scenario if, if someone has a high antibody titer? I mean, I think if you have, um, if you have strong reactivity to one serotype, um, then you're likely to have significant cross reactivity to the other serotypes. So, so it's not like the different serotypes look completely different. I mean, they're, they're sufficiently similar. If you have low activity, you might have, it might, it, it might not necessarily cross react to the other types of serotypes necessarily. But I mean, if you're talking about a redosing situation, 
in it's very likely that there will be a very strong antibody response um, um, to that first dosing. And so if you're trying to get around that by using a different serotype the second time around, that may not work um, just because of the cross reactivity. Yeah, I think that's exactly true because often what happens when the virus goes inside, the response is polyclonal. It is not to one portion of the virus. It reacts to multiple different regions. So the similarities, as uh, Perry said, there are many. Yeah, no, that is, it, it's definitely something that we're, I think, talking about more and, and trying to make sure that, that folks are aware of that they, there, there is you know, similarity between those, even though we have different numbers and they have slightly different preferences in terms of the, the tissues in the body that they, um, they target. Um, Raju, this one came in. So asking about when, when blocking the innate immune response, um, just a question about you know, how long um, kind of you would be blocking this, uh, the, the immune response, is it something um, that we just need to you know, block until AAV has, has cleared the system in order to prevent uh, an immune response? Um, and is there any long-term implications from doing any, you know, this kind of immune suppression strategies? Excellent question. So theoretically, I think uh, uh, there is no need for a long-term in suppression of the innate immune response because most of these processes occur very, very quickly. So therefore, analogous to current prednisone dose, essentially, you give the suppressors of the innate immune response right before gene therapy, redirect the virus from phagocytes to the muscle. So that's what we are doing. Once it is in the muscle, you, you, we don't have to keep. So it's a transient immune suppression. No, thank you. Um, I think that, that helps clarify that. And then we, we've also had a, a number of questions come in regarding um, the, the use of steroids and how that relates to gene therapy. Obviously, we, we mentioned um, that that is used as, uh, as part of the um, kind of the safety um, aspect of gene therapy that, that patients are put on a high dose. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we've had a few questions from, I think, parents coming in, you know, does it uh, I, I maybe leading up to it, does uh, the daily versus the weekend dosing matter? Obviously, when in the clinical trials, they move to daily for those, those high doses. Um, and then as well, following gene therapy, is it something where someone would have to stay on daily? Could they be transitioned back to, to you know, a, a weekend dose? Um, just kind of get your, you know, your thoughts on that. So maybe I'll take this one. Um, it the, this do, steroid dosing regimen, you know, is going to vary from study to study um, in terms of what you what the patients need to be on coming into the study, and then the what they would need to be on during the duration of the study. And part of that is to make sure that whatever perceived effect or benefit is not due to an increase or change in the steroid treatment. Um, so. I can tell you one of the studies that we're involved in requires that patients be on daily steroids prior to being in the study, just, just so that you know, as they try to collect data on the boys who are participating, that the, you know, um, if there's a, an improvement, for instance, that we can really attribute it to the gene therapy treatment and not necessarily to a sudden change from weekend dose to daily dose steroids, which some people spec have speculated that may make a difference. Um, and so there's that issue. And, and, you know, as Raji has pointed out that during the maybe two, three months after gene therapy, um, you have to be on a daily doses of steroids at reasonably high doses, higher than what we typically use to treat uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, patients in general, just because we're trying to make, to minimize the immunological response to the gene therapy. I think that answers the question. No, it, it does. And I think I just also want to clarify, because you know, I've, I've been, I think, saying uh, prednisone, but I, in, in these instances, prednisone or deflazacort could be used. Um, just want to make sure that, you know, in case any, any you know, parent sees that and thinks they have to be on one or the other. But there's... Yes, and for the, for the two, three months um, um, after gene therapy, 
we've been required to use prednisone just because we understand prednisone. So, you know, I have patients who have enrolled in these studies and they were on deflazacort. And then once they get dose with gene therapy, they're on prednisone for about two or three months. And then as long as everything looks, looks good, um, there aren't any significant liver effects, then we usually move them back to deflazacort or those patients who were on deflazacort. And then um, we had another question come in and I, this is, you know, I think a little bit more, more speculative, but we would, I think, really appreciate to, to hear both of your, your insights is, you know, following gene therapy. So obviously we don't have a, a wealth of in, information. We've, we've had patients that have been dosed for, you know, up to three years now in a small amount and, and a larger number with, uh, you know, maybe a year of data. Um, but thinking forward um, outside of redosing, but, but layering on other, other therapies in combination, um, one would be, you know, what do we need to know before we could start laying on, you know, therapies that maybe target downstream aspects of the disease? Um, and the other one is the question was specifically about um, using, um, you know, an exon skipping therapy um, post gene therapy. If, if that was something where um, that would be uh, able to happen, if that'd be a negative interaction um, with those, you know, how would those potential, you know, the, the microdystrophin and the a near full length dystrophin produced from exon skipping interact. Um, and if that's something that is you know, possible, is it being explored? Um, just to, to get your thoughts. So maybe I'll start and Raju can provide a, a more detailed answer after that. Um, you know, I think one way to, I, I still think about, you know, the microdystrophin, mini dystrophin gene therapies is, is we're, we're providing gene um, a surrogate gene replacement. So we're, you know, we're not actually using dystrophin, we're using a shortened and likely imperfect version of dystrophin. Okay. Um, and it's not even in most of our patients, it's not even making it as far as we can tell to every muscle fiber. Um, you know, when we stain, you know, we're looking at maybe about 50% of the muscle fibers staining positive for this microdystrophin after we give it. Um, and so, so there's, there certainly are limitations to what uh, we can expect out of microdystrophin gene therapy because the protein is not perfect and because we're not getting it to every single muscle. Um, so, you know, I think I, ex I fully expect that there's going to be room for further, you know, further improvement or further, for, further benefit. And we have to look at additional therapies. We're going to have to look at you know, downstream. We can even still look at other forms, other ways that we can restore dystrophin expression, um, as, such as exon skipping or, you know, but I think, um, well, I, I think those things are not going to be obsolete by any stretch of the imagination because of those reasons. And so that's, that, that's how I view this. And maybe Raju can yeah. provide some. No, I think you said it very well, Perry. I think it's that's exactly right. So it is unlikely these therapies, we can convert these children back to normal muscle. That's not possible. So that means there is ongoing damage. That means a lot of processes that are happening, they may happen at a very reduced rate. So we need other combination therapies. And, uh, you know, as is mentioned before, uh, uh, several years back, PPMD uh, had a conference talking purely on combination therapies. So those efforts are critical for us because the, it, we have this connotation, somehow gene therapy clears everything and that's not true. As Perry mentioned, we are not replacing the real gene. And also we are not replacing, there is no way to get back lost muscle fully. You can get back some, but not all. Now, those are important considerations as we continue to, to move forward and, and continue to, to follow these boys that have been dosed and, and look towards um, dosing additional boys as well. Yeah, I think one of the concerns uh, about the descriptor for a gene therapy is one and done. And I understand that you're giving this AAV gene therapy time one, times one, and you're not going to repeat it, not able to repeat it, at least at this time. But for patients and families, it is not one and done in terms of stopping and halting disease progression. It is a one-time therapy that hopefully will slow progression. And then we have to think about adding on other opportunities along the way. And hopefully 
the participation in the clinical trial process once one more time, right? Or, or many more times as new possibilities occur. No, thank you, Pat. It's, it is a really important consideration and, and then kind of coming back to the language we use when we discuss this is, is really important. Um, but uh, I, you know, I think we're, we're at about time. So I, I just wanted to say thank you to, to both uh, Dr. Nagarajan and Dr. Shea. We, we really appreciate um, your time today. Um, it was a great presentation and really enjoyed the, the discussion that we got to have. Um, and I, I would like to remind everyone, of course, that um, you know, we'll, we'll be discussing you know, gene therapy and, and those various aspects, of course, at, the, at our virtual conference again this year. So um, if you haven't had the chance to register, um, please do. We're going to be holding that at the end of uh, June, I believe, the, the 23rd through the 26th. Um, and so uh, this recording as well will be posted onto PPMD's website um, in the next uh, next week. So again, thank you everyone for, for tuning in today. And thank you, Dr. Shea and Dr. Nagarajo. It was greatly appreciated. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Pat.